men are working in a hostile environment. On their ability and the ability of divers like them to work efficiently and in safety will depend fuller understanding of the ocean's mysteries and perhaps even the ultimate survival of the human race. The sea is a mixture of all the waters of this world. The moisture in the clouds, the humidity in the air we breathe, and the fresh waters of lakes and rivers on which our lives depend. All these waters come from the sea and return to the sea. Indeed, the seas which cover over 70% of the Earth may be the only water to be found anywhere in the universe. And our planet, sometimes called the water planet, is the only one on which life as we know it is sustained. From the seas we derive protein to feed increasing global populations. From the sea we can expect to generate the next family of antibiotics with which to treat human illness. On the floor of the ocean lie huge mineral deposits and beneath the continental shelf are greatly needed reserves of petroleum and other resources. The Navy, whose defense needs require it to operate in all the oceans of the world, has a major stake in improving man's capacity to work continuously in an ocean environment. To this end, it has brought together scientists of many disciplines to advance the limits of oceanographic knowledge and improve our underwater technologies. These men are a far cry from the old hard hat divers of the past. They are highly trained individuals who will be able to spend much of their lives working underseas with sophisticated tools on a complex variety of tasks. They are diving for science. But working down here is extremely difficult. Ocean waters are 800 times denser than air. Every movement is slowed, laborious. The five physical senses are diminished or abolished. Vision, hearing, smell, taste and touch are all affected to varying degrees and must be restored or improved by mechanical or electronic means. Men diving in the conventional mode, like these divers, must interrupt their work at frequent intervals to reascend to the surface because of human limitations. This takes time. Although man can descend quickly because he can adapt easily to increasing pressure, he must ascend slowly to avoid the bends or decompression damage. Now, however, a new diving technology called saturation diving has been developed, which greatly increases man's time underwater. Much of the physiological research on it has been pioneered by a naval medical doctor, Captain George Bond, director of hyperbaric research at the Naval Coastal Systems Laboratory in Panama City, Florida. As you have seen, the conventional diving techniques utilize a great deal of time in decompression and are somewhat inefficient. We hope that we have overcome these problems to a large extent with the introduction of saturation diving. But whether the man is in the saturation or conventional diving mode, it is still necessary to monitor his physiological functioning very carefully indeed. Fortunately, today we have a new set of tools to do this job. First, we'll connect up the arterial probe for measuring blood gases concurrently with your pulmonary function test. It has become apparent that the this limiting will factor will in deep like sea exposures way. will be the ability of the human lungs to move a breathing mixture, and so to deliver oxygen and remove carbon dioxide in the case of the working diver. It is only through a careful study of the heart-lung system of man under all projected conditions of stress that we can provide data for the improved engineering design of diver's breathing equipment. Coming up on this next one, hit it as hard and fast as you can. Come on, one, come on, that's it. Hard, 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 hard. That's it, hit her hard, hit her hard, hit her hard, hit her hard. Hit her hard. Okay, that's good. Now you can come off. Now relax. 
In this laboratory, we feel that we are particularly fortunate in that the engineers and the physiologists work literally side by side. 60 feet, okay in the chamber. 60 feet, okay in the chamber. Stand by for a vent. What are man's physiological limits in high pressures on the ocean floor? How does his body respond? His lungs? What happens to his blood? What are the best proportions of oxygen and nitrogen or helium in his breathing mixture? At what depths? The answer must be evaluated and tested, and tested again, as man's underwater capabilities are slowly and constantly extended. There is another important physiological barrier to deep sea diving, and that is the conservation of the body temperature in the diver. Wally Jenkins is a Navy oceanographer who has gone under Arctic ice. Cold can sap the strength from a diver, make him lose his memory, make him inefficient very quickly. Sometimes in extremely cold water, he can lose his capability to operate within seconds. To go under the ice is a unique experience, to say the least. Usually you have no ambient light, a thick covering of, of heavy ice, very black, usually very deep, and very cold. The diver is likely to encounter cold water in all but a very few areas of the temperate world. Any deep dives, you'll run into it, and especially now as we get more and more engaged in the Arctic and the far north. And up there we have found an environment that is unique. Water temperatures of 28, 29 degrees Fahrenheit, ice cover, air temperatures 40 below zero. We are actively engaged in improving our capability to dive under the ice for several reasons. It has one of the largest continental shelves in the world, the large amounts of raw material found up there, as well as submarine passage under the ice, your marine environment, and the effect, last but not least, of the ecology. We need to send men down to actually observe on site what is going on, what can be done to improve it, and how we can better work with the environment. For Arctic waters or any deep dives, a suit with a sophisticated heating system is required. This prototype consists of a heat distribution inner garment with its own self-contained pumping system, which provides a uniform layer of fluid about the diver's body for insulation. Then comes a dry outer garment and a protective helmet, which keeps the diver's head warm and also provides him with a heated breathing mixture. Each refinement is tested under simulated Arctic conditions. The ultimate objective is a simple, safe, and practical garment, which will allow a diver to work efficiently and in comfort in freezing water for as long as he needs to get the job done. Is your seal all right on your helmet, over? Seal's tight. How about your suit temperature? Are you warm? Warm as toast. Sign language serves divers in simple situations. But with the increasing complexity of underwater missions, free swimming divers must be able to talk to each other with their underwater habitat or with their surface ship. Radio waves don't work underwater. Sound waves do. So, an important element in underwater communication systems is a device called a transponder, which both sends and receives sound waves, and simultaneously converts these high-frequency sound waves into the lower frequencies of intelligible speech, and vice versa. This is far from an easy task. Shallow waters and obstructions like reefs, for instance, create a variety of echoes and other interferences. Also, speech within the narrow confines of a mass becomes distorted. As a diver goes deeper, increasing pressures affect his vocal tract and alter his normal speech patterns. There is an additional complication. Below 200 feet, divers can no longer breathe compressed air which contains nitrogen because of its narcotic effect. Instead, the breathing mixture contains helium, which has a peculiar effect on the vocal cords, 
creating a sort of Donald Duck speech. Consequently, miniature electronic processors are being developed to unscramble helium speech and make it intelligible. In the water now. You have a bet, bet. These requirements dictate the need for a full face, waterproof, yet comfortable mask containing earphones, microphone, and other equipment, all operating automatically so as to leave the diver's hands free. Another of the problems a diver has is undersea navigation. The Navy's new swimmer acoustic navigation system, or diver gator, tells the diver his speed, true course, and distance off the bottom. Doppler, or sonar electronics, calculate for him his swim rate and compensate for his drift. This handheld sonar device helps a diver to locate objects under the water. It operates in two ways. In the passive mode, it will receive signals from a homing device. In the active mode, it can be used to detect silent objects, that is, objects that send out no signals of any kind. It can spot a small object at 100 yards. Extended underwater explorations can require divers to move rapidly over long distances. For this purpose, different kinds of swimmer delivery vehicles are being designed to transport two or more men and substantial payloads to remote areas. Its electronic systems allow the craft to avoid obstacles compensate for cross currents, and travel accurately and quickly to where the divers must go. These vehicles save a diver's time and, more importantly, his strength. Almost as important as the development of new diving techniques and equipment is the Navy's transfer of its expertise to young men and women who plan to become true working scientists in the sea. The program, called Scientists in the Sea, or SITS for short, is coordinated by Wilbur Eaton, one of the first Navy aquanauts, and by Tony Llewellyn, professor of marine engineering at the University of Florida. To this end, the, a consortium of the state universities of the Florida State System and the Naval Coastal Systems Lab of the U.S. Navy is formed, and we provide a full summer's quarters tuition at the graduate level for students whose professional interests lie in this area. I believe uh, we are trying to teach the students, number one, uh, leadership, uh, number two, uh, discipline in diving, number three, a complete confidence of themselves and to assist the fellow diver in the many ways that come about. The applicants are rigorously screened physically and psychologically, and must be already experienced in scuba diving. During 10 rugged weeks, students are taught to use the latest equipment on land and operationally. Part of this training takes place at the Navy's offshore stages. The final phase is a week at the Hydro Laboratory off Freeport in the Bahamas, where the students work and live in a unique underwater habitat and become thoroughly familiar with the theory and practice of saturation diving. I'm a SIS student. I'm living here at 50 feet of water in this habitat where I'm presently saturated and I've been living here now for three days. Saturation is when the nitrogen in the air under pressure goes into solution in the bloodstream and the bloodstream can accept no more nitrogen. The advantage of saturation is that the diver does not have to return to surface within an appointed amount of time. This way he can stay down on the bottom and work virtually 24 hours a day if he had the stamina and the air to do it. After saturation, there is a price that has to be paid. This price is time. In our case, it will take us 13 and one half hours to decompress before we can go back to the surface.
I'm in marine archaeology, and with the kind of things that I'll be doing, I've been allowed a chance to practice these techniques, to talk to other people who have equipment that I could use that might help me in my work. I think a lot of the students in the program have never spent time at sea, working in a scientific schedule, having to work round the clock, diving every so many hours, a very rigorous routine. It was uh, kind of introduce them to the kind of things that they're going to be experiencing later on. I've uh, learned quite a bit from the SITS program. For a general view, I've seen how different disciplines use diving in geology and archaeology. And then in particular, I've seen how it will apply in marine biology, use of some of the sophisticated equipment, photography, and uh, how I can apply it in my field. Basically, I'm studying uh, the effects of depth and pressure on the human body, and the effects of different equipment, how the body adapts to the use of different equipment, like how a different configuration fin can better enable the, the diver to work more efficiently, or how a better mass can help the diver to see more effectively. As a Canadian student, I think that I'm lucky in being able to participate in this program. It shows that there's a lot of uh, complementary research being done between the two countries and it'll be very useful to me when I do go back home. I think being trained with qualified Navy personnel is very important in teaching us the proper techniques and skills in diving procedures and situations. We're learning to do things properly under very safe conditions. I'm interested in uh, fish biology, specifically in physiology and behavior of fish. Being a fish behaviorist the best way to study fish is by being underwater, observing what they're doing. Um, I just come from underwater. We have an experiment planned with lobster. We're planning on tagging them, tracking them, and observing their uh, diurnal movements, where they locate in dens, whether they change dens periodically. Uh, personally, I, I feel that the self-confidence aspect of it has been the most important thing I've learned. This is my first experience with the military, so uh, just learning to do things in, a, in an orderly fashion with a number of other people, uh, that in itself was an experience to me. Out of what I've learned from the SIS program, I think the thing that stands out most to me is a deeper realization that although we are newcomers and more or less outsiders in the ocean environment, man is an integral part of nature's scheme and shouldn't consider himself privileged to the point of not needing to follow its rules or to be held accountable for his actions in the environment. Here at the Naval Coastal Systems Laboratory, the new ocean simulation facility is where man's future on the floor of the ocean may be largely determined. This extraordinary installation is available to all governmental, educational, and industrial laboratories engaged in oceanic research. The OSF, as it is called, is capable of reproducing different diving conditions down to more than 2,200 feet below the surface. In it, man's physiological limitations and the equipment and procedures he needs to go even deeper into the sea can be tested and developed safely and economically in an infinite variety of simulated underwater environments. Today we're here to conduct our pre-dive briefing for a thousand foot biomedical dive. The purpose of our dive today is a physiological monitoring of men and also for performance testing of the man-machine interface. The dive will commence with two subjects and we'll initially compress them to 14 feet on air take about one minute to get there. A highly diversified group of engineering and medical specialists direct the dive throughout its duration. After we get the okay from the medical officer, we'll commence our dive onward to our first stop of 400 feet at a rate of five feet per minute. The core of the OSF is a huge complex of wet and dry chambers. The long upper chamber, called the dry chamber, is divided into five sections connected by locks so that they can be used together or separately. Each section has its own entry hatch and small pass-through locks. 
Each contains life support facilities and conveniences, such as berths, showers, sanitary facilities, and workspace for extended habitation. Emergency breathing systems, fire protection systems, and communication networks ensure safety during manned testing. Closed circuit television enables control room personnel to observe their colleagues inside any of the dry chambers at all times. All dives are run from the dive control console by the diving supervisor and his team. Tell the divers to stand by to go to 14 feet on air. Uh, in the chamber divers, uh, stand by to go to 14 foot on air. Standing by in the chamber to go to 14 foot. The way a dive is simulated in the dry chamber is by changing the degrees of pressure, temperature, relative humidity, and the breathing mixture as these would occur during an actual dive. We're at 14 feet, at 14 feet, Chief. Check out all the instrumentation here and see if we're running. Uh, we're gonna stay at 14 feet until we check out the instrumentation. Backing up the men at the dive control console and each of the individual control stations is a computer complex which makes it possible to program each dive in advance and to record every detail of the dive as it happens. An important feature of this resource, as in any facility exploring the outer limits of man's environment, is its capability of safeguarding the lives of the divers by stopping a dive the instant any malfunction might occur and holding the dive at that depth until the condition is corrected. Check with the divers, see if they're okay. Okay in the chamber? All hands are okay, and all systems check out. Very good. Okay, let's secure the air and shift the helium. This station, called the Mixmaster, controls and records the flow, pressure, and temperature of oxygen, nitrogen, or helium, or other gases into the dry chamber from a storage field holding thousands of cubic feet of gas under pressure. The chromatograph enables a specialist to monitor and analyze, on a continuous basis, the condition of the diver's breathing mixture, the chamber exhaust, and data from as many as 30 other sources. at 400 foot holding dive. The uh, divers in the chamber, are you ready for the biomedical test? The divers in the chambers are all ready. Okay. Okay, we'll check with you from the biomedical console. Each new diving technique, each refinement of diving equipment, each further penetration of unexplored undersea environments must be measured in human terms. What new stress does it place on the diver's ability to function? What buildup occurs? How long before his other faculties may be altered? And to what degree? At the medical consoles, where pulse rates, respiration rates and patterns, EKGs, encephalograms, body temperatures and other vital signs are recorded on printouts or oscilloscopes, Doctors are methodically finding out the answers to these and other questions. Answers which must be learned if the hostile environment of the sea is ever to be turned into a friendly environment. Hey, topside, do you read? In the chamber, read you loud and clear. Roger, uh, tell uh, Captain Bond that our medical testing's uh, complete and uh, we're just about ready with the Kirby Morgans. Anytime you're ready, uh, let us know, okay? The ocean simulation facility includes a large tank where submersibles are tested for watertight integrity before being placed in the huge wet chamber or wet pot. The wet pot holds 50,000 gallons of water which can be regulated for varying degrees of salinity, turbidity and temperature from below freezing to almost 100 degrees Fahrenheit. A vast ring of bolts secures the hydraulic hatch capable of containing millions of pounds of water pressure, such as those encountered close to a half mile below the surface. The temperature in the wet chamber is steady at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Roger, sounds good. The biomedical test scheduled for today is taking place at 400 feet. 
Tomorrow, these men will descend for further tests at the 1,000-foot level. Why? So the day after tomorrow, the knowledge gained will enable them to enter the sea at the 2,000-foot level, and beyond that, in a few months or years, to live and work at who knows what depths. Are these greater depths capable of attainment? Who, a scant 50 years ago, really believed man would walk on the moon? Who, before saturation diving just a few years ago, believed divers could work below 200 feet? We know there is light in the ocean at great depths. What physiological principles make this possible? Can man adapt these to his own use? And we're holding depth. They'll rest from midnight till 6, and then we'll start at 6 in the morning traveling. They'll start traveling at 6 in the morning to another destination, to another breakthrough of knowledge. And day by day, that knowledge is replacing the mystery which has shrouded the ocean since men first entered it. Not so long ago, diving was a kind of barnstorming adventure, limited, primitive, and risky. Today, it is a science, and the Navy's role in the defense of the oceans, which has led to the development of that science, and to the work being done in institutions such as the Naval Coastal Systems Laboratory, cannot be minimized. New dimensions of knowledge about every aspect of our oceans, and respect for their integrity, are vital to our future. The oceans, in a very fundamental sense, are mankind's last, and most precious frontier. Along with other nations, our Navy is interested in pursuing continuously the development of manned machine systems to be used in the exploration and wise exploitation of the oceans of the world. Thus, we hope that we are adding a great deal to man's eventual promise of a dominion over the sea.